What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Sound Attack once again, and welcome to a review of the Sapphire Nitro Plus RX 590 Special Edition. This is quite awkward timing as <laughs> both the release of the actual card itself and this review with the release of the 1660 Ti coming out shortly after. I don't have my hands on one, but I want to pick one up because I feel like those will be a fun head to head battle in some titles. However, as we're finding out, it does appear that the 1660 Ti is is kind of a, a pretty good option in this budget range, making this review even more difficult. However, we're just going to go over some of the numbers and go over, of course, the fan noise, the power consumption, and so on as it relates to Windows 10 gaming, because as I did get this running in Linux, I'm still having issues with pushing the testing to the limit and being able to determine things like reliability over time just with stress testing and so on and so forth. It's a lot easier in Windows 10 for me just because I've been doing it so long. Without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so stats first. It has 2,304 stream processors with an advertised 1,560 megahertz boost clock with eight gigabytes of GDDR5 clocked at 2,100 megahertz over a 256-bit bus. It has a 175-watt TDP with two 95-millimeter fans that are ball-bearing. It has four heat pipes, two different sizes, one smaller than the other, and it has an RGB Sapphire logo, but the fans appear to only be blue as far as I can tell and have been reported to turn uh, a teal slash green color over time on the older 580 versions of this. I can't confirm that this one in particular hasn't resolved that, but that's something to keep in mind. It is FreeSync 2 compatible. It has black diamond chokes, a dual BIOS switch, which is fantastic and a single 8-pin PCIe power and a single 6-pin PCIe power adapter additionally, which is for the 175-watt TDP. It does say it shouldn't go above 250 watts at any time. Bumping into the benchmarks here, we have Far Cry New Dawn. Uh, on Ultra at 1080p, we had Minza 55 with an average of 72 and a max of 94. So just like in their advertisement on their webpage, you are getting 1080p 60fps Ultra in Far Cry 5 or Far Cry New Dawn. And this continues on and you can see this as well in of course the Shadow of the Tomb Raider with a 1080p high preset. We had mins of 52 with average of 71 and a max of 120. Bumping up to 1440p, you can do it. And if you bump settings down to like medium, I don't think you'd have much of an issue. Both in Far Cry New Dawn, where at Ultra with 1440p, we had mins of 41, average of 54 and a max of 69. While on the Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it bumped down to about 38 FPS mins at high with an average of 49 and a max of 76. So it does have potential to be a 1440p gaming card. And let's say you were doing a 1440p 144 hertz monitor uh, for something like Counter-Strike Go. I don't think you're going to have any issues. I did bump into Apex Legends, but Apex Legends, I, I didn't really run a benchmark. I just played a game, captured the footage with the FPS counter through Riva Tuner statistics running. And I'm happy to report that at 1080p, it does stay above 60 the entire time with decent visual settings settings applied. However, bumping up to 1440p, I had some weird stutter issues that I couldn't get resolved. I'm not sure if that has to do with maybe the the Ryzen 7 2700 that's in there uh, or the actual GPU itself, but 1080p is going to be about max where you want to go for that perfect smooth frame rate, at least in Apex Legends, which I know is a popular title. That being said, moving on to some synthetic benchmarks, Firestrike had a score of 16,194 and it passed 99% of the frames on the stress test. During the stress test, we also did the temperature, which we'll talk about here in just a tad. Now, the other two synthetic benchmarks that we ran were Superposition and Time Spy. And Time Spy is a 1440p test and we saw a score of 4,977. While in Superposition, it's a 4K optimized test and we saw a score of 3,752. You can compare that to either the system you currently have running or go look up 
the different various GPUs and what they scored as well. Now I did say we would talk about temperatures, but I did have one more test. And unfortunately we did prove the whole 1080p ultra thing wrong with Metro Exodus. Bumping into Metro Exodus with the built-in benchmark, which you can actually run through the game files. It's a little convoluted to get to. Maybe I can uh, post how you can get to it. It's gonna be in your system files. You're gonna have to go actually run the benchmark itself, but then from there you can do multiple passes. Make sure you do at least three passes and kind of average them out because what I notice is the first run seems to always be significantly lower than pass two and three if you're doing the synthetic benchmark. Now, as Gamer Nexus had reported, it isn't really true gaming performance with the synthetic benchmark, but it does provide an easy comparison to other GPUs, which is why we're using it. That being said, at 1080p Ultra with DirectX 11, I tested DirectX 12 too, and neither one seemed to have a huge advantage over the other. We had a min of 20 with an average of 36 and a max of 56. So in this particular case, the advertising for 1080p Ultra gaming card does fall a little bit short and there's some various reasons for that metro has always been a demanding game and it always will continue to be a demanding game and so pick and choose your settings uh, as you see fit now finally the temperatures were pretty good over a lengthy 20 minute to i think we went up to 60 minutes total at one point um for the fire strike stress test we got a max temperature of 75 c with an ambient room temperature of 25 degrees celsius now that is of course on the stock fan curve because we left it all there and you can can actually crank those fans up as you see fit but they do seem to get a little noisy a little noisier than i would expect from a high-end card like this they are just ball bearing fans and the 95 millimeter size while being large for a gpu still is going to be louder than if you were able to get some larger fans on there that being said here is the sound test right now So there's the sound test. I'm happy to report that this GPU did meet all of my expectations from an advertising perspective outside of that one outlier from Metro Exodus, meaning that if you're looking for a 1080p ultra card, this is the one you're going to want to pick up and you are going to get the advertised boost clock as well as the advertised power consumption. Speaking of which, we do need to go over that. The power consumption at idle for this system is about 130 watts, booting up into both a DirectX 12 and a DirectX 11 synthetic benchmarks. Only saw it peak at about 290 watts full system, which means that give or take, the GPU is running at about 160 watts max. Um, that's because with the synthetic benchmarks, even though it is 100% GPU, there is still some CPU bumping up there as well. So you have to take that into account with the idle. So you basically take the 290, subtract what it was at idle, which was the 130, we get 160. So the max that that GPU could be taking up would be about 160 watts which is 15 watts below the advertised TDP, which I'm pretty happy with. I hope this review answered all your questions about the Sapphire Nitro Plus Special Edition RX 590. If you have any more questions, let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to leave a like, and of course, any other positive or negative comments or advice you have for these videos down in the comment section below. And I hope to see you guys soon. If you wanna check me out on my Twitch page, make sure you go to um, twitch.tv slash blind run. And I'm over there playing lots of games. That will make cry five. I finished my first playthrough of, and I think I'm gonna skip the rest of Far Cry New Dawn because of those pesky microtransactions. I will see you next Tuesday.